on rodeo, prayer warriors have descended on a Ralph's supermarket parking lot. The first century, a skinny man in athletic shorts, weaves through the parked cars on an old Schwinn. He flags down the driver of a T-Bird. They exchange quick greetings, then bow their heads and join hands, oblivious for the moment, to the crash of street traffic, the manic dance to parking spots, the rustle of grocery bags, and runaway shopping carts. On this hallowed plot of blacktop in South Los Angeles, time is suspended, and God vibrates through the chassis of each parked car as the men bond in the simple bliss of scripture. In their elite suburban subdivisions, ivory towers, and gentrified redoubts, there are a few writers in the Western atheist canon who pay serious attention to the intersection of economic justice, religion, race, and place. And this is what I will call one of the perks of the white Western condition. The privilege to be considered the voice of universal experience and to float godlike above and beyond and be untethered by the realities of urban communities in places like Detroit, Cleveland, New York, LA. And LA in particular has always been fantasized as a city of extremes, as either a playground for white starlets or a ghetto cesspit rife with drive-bys, gangsters, and race riots. And this has always given white middle America comfort in its belief that those people of color are poor because they're shiftless, lazy, pathological, and not as hardworking and bootstrapping as good salt-of-the-earth white Americans. And the atheist variation of this goes that those black people are so intractably hyper-religious due to bad cultural conditioning. And to paraphrase the burning question that black atheists typically get at these confabs, why do you Negroes, oh, excuse me, I mean African Americans, why do you African Americans invest so deeply in the religion and the God of your oppressor? Don't you people know that you would be better off that the antidote to all of your social problems is to cleave to sterling examples of democracy, justice, slaveholding, rape, and pedophilia like Thomas Jefferson? And so I caught the parking lot prayer warriors about a week before I was scheduled to speak at the Texas Free Thought Convention in Houston years ago. And it was an ironic send-off to my trip and a reminder of the visceral hold of Jesus and the peculiar challenges of black secularism. Five years ago, in this particular parking lot, two men holding hands might have elicited a homophobic beatdown or double takes. But now, the public performance of prayer, street preaching, and proselytizing have reemerged with revivalist vengeance born of the vicious arc of the recession. And in predominantly African-American Lamert Park, which is in the Crenshaw District, the personalized license plates tell the tale. God's favorite child, blessed for life, diva for God. And on Sundays, in Lamert Park, elderly African-American men wave banners that proclaim Jesus loves gangsters too. So let's break it down. Long before Occupy Wall Street's critique of capitalism made it fashionable to lament the demise of the American dream amongst white Americans, joblessness, homelessness, and foreclosure were a reality for many in South LA. At 8.7% of LA County's population, African Americans are 40% of its incarcerated and 50% of its homeless. And the lines at faith-based church assistance programs, food programs, and job programs are packed to the gills. And so in this era of endless depression, not recession, for communities of color, the prayer warriors have really become a bellwether 
of economic devastation and social malaise, particularly given the rank paradox of so-called unlimited opportunity couched within the reality of racialized inequality in this era of so-called American exceptionalism, America and the West being the best. And so for many people of color who are being exhorted to let go and let God by their pastors, prayer is a means of establishing sanctuary, solidarity, in-group status, and out-group stigma. In communities of color that are increasingly hyper-segregated, prayer has become the last sham gasp of dynamism, power, and control under capitalist neoliberalism. And certainly the mainstreaming of prayer also exemplifies Pentecostalism's rise as a global and domestic force. And Latino Pentecostals, as some of you know, are fast eclipsing the dwindling white evangelical population. And a lot of Latino Pentecostal organizing is being propelled by women of color. Because Pentecostalism, for some, not for all, but for some, is a bulwark against the national climate that has become more vociferously anti-undocumented immigrant, xenophobic, and nativist. And so 70 years ago, in communities in South LA, areas that have been demonized within the mainstream media, in communities like Inglewood, Watts, Compton, Baldwin Hills, and Lemur Park, 70 years ago, these were predominantly white areas. African Americans could not buy homes in these areas due to the institution of racially restrictive covenants, which were dismantled by the Supreme Court in 1948 under the Shelley versus Kramer decision. And so after fleeing these areas in abject terror in the 50s and 60s, aided and abetted by vehicles of white affirmative action like FHA loans and GI Bill loans and redlining. Whites are slowly but surely, lo and behold, trickling back into these areas because they've been priced out of wealthier enclaves, traditionally white strongholds like West LA and the Valley. And so we see these trends over and over again nationwide where middle class and working class African American home owners and home buyers who were targeted disproportionately by predatory and subprime lending policies. These home owners and home buyers are being displaced from historically African American areas. And this further erodes black wealth because black wealth is of course concentrated in home equity. So what do the economics of white privilege and white supremacy look like in this brave new hyper-segregated Jim Crow era, to use Michelle Alexander's term? The economics of white privilege and white supremacy look like stop and frisk policies and prison pipelining policies for youth of color, and college for white youth. They look like brownfields, vacant lots, storefront churches, and liquor stores for youth of color, and good old Whole Foods, living wage job centers, recreational spaces, green spaces, and park spaces for white youth. Because white privilege means never having to be constructed as the racialized other systemically in any context. It means not having to be conscious that the paying participants of color at plush secular conferences are often outnumbered by the black and brown help. Drunk on the Kool-Aid of Western exceptionalism, there are some atheists, white and of color, who believe that secularism in and of itself equals social justice and use this 
to strenuously and unabashedly demonize the so-called cultural and religious primitivism of third world cultures and communities of color. But what is secularism under a rapidly capitalist post-industrial economy where white people have 20 times the wealth as African Americans and Latinos, and more and more of our children, black and brown, are being pipelined into prisons as early as preschool, and one in three African American males and one in six Latino males will be incarcerated in their lifetime. And so secularism under capitalism without unlimited access to living wage jobs, to affordable housing, to culturally responsive educational opportunities that pipeline our young people into colleges and not prisons, and to reproductive and comprehensive health care that, yes, encompasses abortion and birth control on demand, is ultimately not tenable for women of color, particularly African American women, given the way in which black women's productivity, sexuality, and morality has been demonized, caricatured, and stereotyped in the mainstream. And so women of color in general, and black women in particular, because we have been so universally caricatured as the bitch, hoe, welfare queen, and Jezebel, hello, do not have the luxury and the privilege to occupy this space of liberated post-feminist hypersexuality a la Miley, I twerk, therefore I am Cyrus, <laughs> without dire consequences. And this is underscored by the disproportionate criminalization of African American women, such that black women are three times more likely to be tried, convicted, and incarcerated for criminal offenses than are white women. According to the Center for American Progress, one in 19 black women versus one in 100 white women will be incarcerated in their lifetimes. And overall, black criminal defendants receive harsher, longer, and more mandatory minimum sentences than do whites who commit Identical, identical crimes or more severe crimes. And this emanates from the K through 12 system where African American children hands down are those that receive the greatest number of suspensions and expulsions and black girls are suspended and expelled more than any other group of boys in the United States besides black boys. And so in both of my books, Moral Combat and Godless Americana, I argue that the literature on women, secularism, and free thought is really inadequate when it comes to capturing the experiences of women of color navigating racism, sexism, and poverty in communities of color. And that the dearth of free, free thought traditions amongst women of color in the U.S. cannot be separated from these legacies of white supremacy, apartheid, and patriarchy. And over the past few years, due to the scholarship of women of color, there's been a move to include forerunning feminist freethinkers of color like Zora Neale Hurston and Nella Larson into the feminist free thought canon. But for the most part, women's histories on secularism, free thought, and humanism really begin with a robust and uncritical embrace of the activism and the ideologies of first wave white feminist free thinkers like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was an abolitionist and a non-believer. And the problem with these appraisals is that Stanton and her colleagues vociferously invoked white supremacist, nativist, and xenophobic rhetoric, for example, in their opposition to the 15th Amendment, which gave African American men the right to vote in 1870. So these women routinely and strategically positioned themselves 
as moral beacons standing atop the racial hierarchy next to white men, arguing why should we, as the exemplars of Western civilization, as rational, intellectual, moral women walk several paces behind these black and brown savages in the fight for the right to vote. And so in her influential work, White Women's Rights, The Racial Origins of Feminism, the historian Louise Michelle Newman notes that, quote, the feelings of racial superiority that Anglo-Protestants nurture concerning their ancestry, heredity, and evolutionary history led them to insist that they shared the white man's inherited capacity for self-government. Indeed, it is not surprising that white female activists had a heightened racial consciousness of themselves as civilized women contributing to and reinforcing dominant religious, scientific, and cultural ideologies that attributed to them unique moral and political roles on the basis of this identity, blending religious conviction with science and political roles on the basis of this identity. They utilized social evolutionary theories and political ideology, i.e. progressivism, and these white proponents of women's rights helped create new roles for themselves that explicitly maintained the racial hierarchies that were based on the presumption that Anglo-American Protestants were culturally as well as biologically superior to other peoples. And so black women did not have the luxury nor the privilege to be secular free thinkers because they were constructed as hypersexual racial others. Their bodies, their labor were the backdrop, were the raw material for vaunted European American notions of individual liberty and sovereign citizenship and morality and scientific exploration and private property. And so where, given this regime of sexual and racial terrorism and erasure, could black women go to be deemed persons, to be affirmed as persons, as subjects? The courts, where their rights were not recognized. The constitution, where their bodies were vessels. The education system, where their culture was demeaned as savage, primitive, and unchristian. Government, where their bodies were deep profit for some of the nation's most esteemed legislators and moral philosophers, like the revered Thomas Jefferson. White churches, where they were debased as Jezebels and amoral children of Ham. Godliness, by default, becomes black women's vehicle for articulating artistry, invention, personhood, control over their limited sphere in this terroristic regime, solidarity, and yes, resistance against a system ostensibly based on universal inalienable rights of democracy and liberty, but in actuality, based on the grand theft and dehumanization of African labor and African bodies. And so the specter of the civilized, liberated, free-thinking, moral, feminine, white feminist free thinker could not have existed without the dialectical construction of the hypersexual black Jezebel. And so given this history, when the GOP demonizes Barack Obama as the food stamp president, because we all know that white people do not use food stamps, and when the GOP demonizes abortion and birth control as the province of, to paraphrase Ann Coulter, sex-praised sluts who cannot keep their legs closed, black women's bodies are its silent and secret currency. Nonetheless, despite the fact that the religious right misogynist backlash has had perhaps the most insidious, the most intractable influence on women of color and communities of color, the backlash against women's rights, gay rights, workers' rights, voters' rights, 
in essence, the backlash against post-medievalism. Despite this fact, there are not droves of women of color who are leaving organized religion. And in fact, if we look at the demographics amongst African-American LGBTQ families, many of them, particularly African-American lesbian families, due to the forces of resegregation, gentrification, and displacement that I mentioned earlier, many of these families are moving to the Bible Belt, to the Deep South, back to their roots, and establishing alternative faith traditions, pushing back against the homophobia, transphobia, and heterosexism of traditional evangelical and fundamentalist congregations. And so I recently attended a protest that was spearheaded by Stop Patriarchy, which is a socialist-aligned group in favor of abortion rights. And it was designed to highlight the draconian wave of Christian fascist-driven legislation against abortion, birth control, and supporting all of these criminalizing fetal homicide laws that disproportionately impact working class and women of color. And this protest was predominantly attended by white women. Now, truth be told, women of color are often hard-pressed to publicly align with abortion rights and pro-choice rights precisely because the disproportionate burden of moral policing that is placed upon them because of these histories of criminalization, slavery, and hypersexualization. In addition to the fact that abortion rights is typically framed within mainstream discourse as a white woman's issue, separate and apart from overarching issues of reproductive and economic justice. And so what millennials call so-called slut shaming is really just a page out of black women's history and a day in the life for most average, ordinary African-American women. Because to quote Bell Hooks, black women's bodies have always been, due to the legacy of slavery, the sign of sexual experience. When black women are raped, there is never any presumption of innocence, feminine frailty, or victimhood. When black women go missing, there are no midnight amber alerts, lifetime movies, or frenzied media blitzes. When black women are victims, a la Marissa Alexander, who some of you may have heard of, of intimate partner violence and systematized domestic abuse, they are loudmouth Jezebels who just deserved it and becoming criminalized and incarcerated when they defend themselves. When black women have children as single adults or teens, there are no reality shows or mom-friendly sitcoms to capture our travails, nor applause for our heroic against-the-odds parenting, and certainly no second chances or to recontextualize the second chance for a teenage black girl who has a child out of wedlock is prison, child protective services, or foster care. And when black women get abortions, due to the regime of policing, criminalization, and theocratic control of black women's sexuality and morality, we're selfish genocidal hoes betraying the black man and black families. And so, like the mainstream women's movement, which has been justifiably dogged by feminists of color for not being intersectional, an atheist movement that simply focuses on religious oppression against those dark others out there in the third world, and is silent on the anti-humanist apartheid policies that criminalize, demonize, and objectify 
people of color, both abroad and within the United States, is ultimately an affront to communities of color, is irrelevant to communities of color. And I want to shift to talking about organizing, particularly when it comes to the needs of youth of color, given the apartheid mass incarceration state. Last year, Black Skeptics awarded First in the Family Humanist Scholarships to five youth from South LA. And we focused on undocumented foster care, homeless, and LGBTQ youth because these youth are at the greatest risk, are the most vulnerable for prison pipelining. And as many of you know, due to Congress's refusal to pass the DREAM Act, undocumented youth have the least access to college, they can't receive federal financial aid, and again, they're vulnerable for incarceration, for placement in foster care, for homelessness due to their parents' high risk for deportation. Some of you may be familiar with the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals policy that was implemented by the Obama administration to help undocumented youth get jobs and go to college and be free for two years of the risk of deportation. So when undocumented youth can't jobs, get jobs, they don't have stable housing, again, their potential for incarceration increases. When queer and trans youth of color are pushed out, and we don't say drop out, we say pushed out. They're being systematically criminalized in their schools for being quote unquote predators, for harassing straight youth, for being profiled because they are gender non-conforming. So because they refuse to remain silent about this targeted harassment and violence, they are at greater risk for incarceration. And a significant number of queer and trans youth are in foster care or homeless, not just due to religious persecution, and definitely we have that in spades in African American and Latino communities, but also because of these issues of socioeconomic upheaval, depression, and mass incarceration. And so recently, when I spoke at a secular assembly for the Northeast meeting, a white woman came up to me afterwards and told me her tale of her two sons. And her two teenage sons were at a party and they were caught with marijuana by the police. And so one son, the white one, was given a citation while the other son, who was African American, was booked and hauled off to jail. And so if we follow these two sons throughout life in this colorblind land of the free, one will have no criminal record, be perceived as innocent until proven guilty, and a true blue American citizen who makes it through merit, bootstraps, and hard work. The other son will have a felony, which means that he will be less likely to be viewed, a la Philip Babson, one of our first in the family humanist winners, as college material, less likely to get a job, less likely to get housing, and more likely to rely on social welfare assistance from a church or from a faith-based organization because those are some of the only organizations in our communities that provide prisoner reentry resources for displaced youth of color. And, but of course, if you're the parents of white children, be you atheist, deist, Satanist, Christian, or anywhere in between, the economics of white privilege shield you. And so this tale of two sons is really a time-worn tale of two Americas, one imperially rich, obscenely undertaxed, and besided with the view of itself as the beacon of world civilization, and the other poor, incarcerated, assetless, hyper-segregated, and downwardly mobile. And so the liberals and progressives in this movement have to decide, are you in your silence going to be complicit with the first America, smug like the GOP, content to revel 
in the secular savior industrial complex. The late poet Audre Lorde once said that the master's tools cannot be used to dismantle the master's house. And so believing that first world secularism is the savior while profiting from the new racialized apartheid gilded age is simply using the master's tools 2.0. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.